Hello and welcome to Children in Our Lives, a program where children and adults speak about violence against children. On this program, we discuss how we relate with our children. And today's issue is thought-provoking, intergenerational violence. What is it? Does it really exist? This discussion will be flagged off by the story of a man whose childhood experience of violence has lived to haunt him as a father and threatens to take on the cycle to his son, of course told to you by your favorite storyteller, Mr. Ranjezi Stephen. Today we host Mr. Deepak Naka, co-director of Raising Voices, to discuss the issue of intergenerational violence. We shall also bring to you Mr. Alienio Marx, a death row prisoner at Luzira Upper Prison, and he will tell us how the violence he experienced as a child has contributed to where he is today. But first, let's begin with a story. As you listen to Okui's story, think about the children in your lives. Think about the violence inflicted on them. Does this happen where you live? What are your thoughts? gathering of all sons and daughters of Africa to continue with the tradition of storytelling. Now this evening, again I'm changing the names of the people in the story to protect them. All right, now the story I'm telling, I'm telling, I'm using a boy called Okui. <laughs> Okui, Okui, was living with his father and they had, he also had a grandmother. And you know how children are with their grandmothers. Now, one time, grandmother is passing by Okui's father's home and he hears the man shouting, you, you, you think you can do, you can misbehave and disobey me and I do nothing? One day, next time you disobey, I will crush your head against the wall. Okui's father was always quarreling, was always fighting, beating children, beating his wife. So everybody in the village was used to this. But, but, the grandmother, when she had this, she was very worried. And every time she saw and heard this man bursting in anger, her heart went in sorrow because she had heard such words before. You see, one day, when o Okui's father, because Okui now is a young boy, his father who is now shouting, who is, when he was still young, the grandmother had brought him white ants in ground nut paste because he liked it so much. When he arrived, when she arrived, sorry, what she saw, she will never forget. As soon as she entered the house with the white ants, expecting he, the grandson to come out jumping and happy. First she heard, ah, ah. the boy was crying. When the grandmother entered, the boy was lying in a corner, crutching her hands and crying. Looking next, the boy's mother was lying in the middle of the room, breathing slowly and actually unconscious. What had happened was that her son had beaten these people so badly and as soon as 
the, 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 the judge came in, the man of his father stormed out and said, you think you can disobey me and I do nothing? Next time I will crush your head against that wall. So when this morning the grandmother heard these words, she was worried. She was worried because she had heard them before and something had happened. Anyway, that morning, the woman was saying, now I have been hearing my son saying this, I did not do anything, now look what he has done. Of course, for him, he went to look for alcohol to drink. The old woman picked the grandson, Okui, the mother, and took them to her home. Unfortunately, her action was too late for the mother. She died. So now here is Okui living with the father and he is shouting the same words the old woman had had. And the, the grandmother is concerned that she did not act. But the reason she did not act was that her own husband the father of Okui's father had also been beating her every day. So now here she was realizing the chain of aggression. The point is she started saying, I must now do something. I must make sure that this little boy does not go on in this suffering and eventually pass it on, and it becomes a generational inheritance. The question, therefore, is you and me. How many people do we know that are inflicting pain on others and we keep quiet? And let me tell you, what happens to you eventually when you grow up unconsciously you start practicing the same thing. If we want violence to children to stop, we must make sure that the children we have now don't get any violence in their life. Yes. Yeah. Then they will not have any reason, any source, any beginning of becoming violent in their own lives. So, today, that's the story. Oh. Let us stop violence. Let us stop violence against these wonderful ones. Let them have an opportunity to live, to smile. When they grow up, they will also make their children smile. Thank you for coming. was Okui's story. Can you imagine? Research has shown that many people who end up as abusers experienced abuse in their lives. In the studio with me right now I have Mr. Deepak Nake from Raising Voices, co-director, and we're going to talk about intergenerational violence. Thank you for being here again. Nice to, be, nice to see you again, Crystal. Nice to see you. Now, okay, the question many people would ask to begin with, is this story real? Does this really happen? It's very much real. It's, in fact, that particular story that you heard is based on a real life event that has been reported to us. And there are many, many examples of stories of people who have experienced violence in their life and then go on to commit violence mm -hmm. themselves mm -hmm. because that's what they know, how to, how to behave in stressful situations. So it's very real. It's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. And as you mentioned, there's quite a lot of now research evidence that shows that that happens. Okay, okay. Now it's quite a mouthful, sure. intergenerational violence. Mm -hmm. Could you just explain it to someone who's hearing it for the first mm -hmm. time? And in fact, it's even more of a mouthful when you get the whole thing, which is intergenerational transmission of violence, wow. which is, uh, but Passing. let's not get stuck <laughs> in the technical terms. What we are talking about here is that often when you look into the lives of people who abuse others, who commit violence against others, you find that they themselves 
also experience violence. And the central idea behind this is that violence is a learned behavior. It means that, you know, as you are growing up, when you see others responding to stress through violence, then as a child and as a growing adult, you also learn that it's okay to learn violently, to respond violently to stressful situations. Mm -hmm. So then often you find that people who are arrested for committing violence or who commit egregious cases of violence, when you look at their life story, you can see clearly that this is where they learned how to behave violently. And that is why, for example, in all the shows that you've been doing so far, we've been talking about how it's important to create non-violent relationships. From a children. young age. Because that's what they're learning. We're teaching them how to behave. We're teaching them what is okay and what is not okay. And intergenerational violence is an example of how children see adults around them behaving violently and learning that, oh, if my father does this, then it must be a good way of behaving. And that's what they're doing. So intergenerational violence, the big word is simply an idea to refer to that, that we, in some ways, children inherit violence or violent way of behaving from people around them. So um, basically, that means in situations where, for example, you have a man who beats his wife, mm -hmm. when his son grows up and he's seeing this, he's probably going to do the same. Maybe he feels that mm -hmm. That's a way of showing love, because mm -hmm. you hear that in our community, mm -hmm. that, oh, you know, you have to beat a woman to show her you love her. Mm -hmm. Is it because that's what you see as a child? Right. So that's what we learn, and that's what a child learns. Yeah? But what is important is we bear in mind that it, is, it doesn't have to be so. It's not like a causal link, that if you see this, then you have to do that. It has to be yeah, that it's way. It's learned. It's, so, it's what it, so that is why it's really important that we don't stigmatize people who experience violence in their childhood and say, ah, you, you're spoiled for life now because you're going to go on. Because there are, just as there are many people who go on to commit violence when they've seen it in their childhood, there are also many others who have experienced violence but don't go mm -hmm. to commit violence towards their spouse or towards their partners. Mm -hmm. And somehow they have learned that actually what my father was doing or what another adult was doing was wrong. And that, that is not the correct way of behaving. And that is why it's important that we don't stigmatize everyone who has experienced violence as that you're going to be a perpetrator. But also, then reverse is also the case, that people who do go on to commit violence, we hold them accountable for their behavior. Mm -hmm. Because whatever you learn, at the end of the day, when you act on it, you're making a choice. Yes, yeah. it's all about making a choice. That's right. Especially, I think, if you focus on how you felt and, and you know, how it was a bad thing to begin mm -hmm. with, just because mm -hmm. it happened doesn't mean it has to keep happening. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, you, you just said um, we should hold people accountable mm -hmm. for their behavior, for mm -hmm. it's a responsibility. Can you just explain that more? And let me add one more idea to that, that when you look at the difference why is it that a lot of children experience violence? Why is it that some of them go on to be violent themselves as adults, but some don't? What is the difference between that child and this child? Mm -hmm. yeah. And research has found that often, even if a child experiences a lot of violence, if there's one or two people in his or her life who show a different way of being an adult, what is sometimes called uh, being an enlightened witness, or somebody who is a different kind of person who says that, okay, this person is violent, but it, there are other ways of being in this world as well. When a child is exposed to somebody who is different, then that child has a chance of growing up to be non-violent. Oh. Yeah. And that is why we're saying that you know, as adults, wherever you are, reach out to children around you, no matter what else is happening in their life. If you can be an example that you don't have to be violent, that violent is not necessarily the most efficient way of resolving conflicts, that violence is not the best way of responding to stress, that there are other more skilled and more productive ways of responding with stress, then in some ways that child stands a chance of going on to become a productive adult who doesn't use violence. And so that's the difference that we're talking about, that intergenerational violence is a cycle that keeps happening again and again and again. And unless somebody, somebody like you, somebody like whoever is watching this show, unless somebody breaks that cycle, we'll be continuously locked in 
Mm -hmm. And that is why, you know, in the previous show, you talked about community heroes. Community heroes are so important because they break the cycle. Yeah? And ordinary people, uh, neighbors, community members, brothers, sisters, cousins, religious leaders, whoever you are, we all come in contact with children who are trying to make sense of the world around them. You know, children are growing. They're like a sponge. Mm. They absorb everything Take that everything is. Take everything in. Yeah. So on the one hand, they might be taking in violence in one part of their life. But if they are seeing somebody else who is saying that actually that is not right, that you could be different, and here is a different way of being, and are a role model, then they'll absorb that too. And then as adults, they will not use violence. They'll be different. So then they have the choice. They've seen that's either way, exactly. and they'll have a choice. And that's right. And at all times in our lives, we have choices. You know, whenever somebody decides to beat somebody, regardless of how angry they are, how stressful they're feeling, it's a choice that they're making. Yeah, that violence is a choice. And we're saying that it's a choice that you don't have to make. There are other more efficient, powerful ways of dealing with that stress that is inside you at that moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess you can say this is a very touchy topic mm. because, as you said, children are sponges, they absorb everything, they learn from their parents, and most people think, okay, because my parents brought me up mm. this way, and I'm okay this way, if I, even if I do it to my child, mm -hmm. I mean, they'll probably grow up and be okay as right. well. So, any last remarks? Absolutely. I think that, you know, intergenerational violence is a very powerful way of people promulgating it, like making it grow over years and years, just continuing and perpetrating it. Mm -hmm. You know, what happens often, what we see in the work that we do, is that the man might beat the woman and the woman might beat the child. So there's that kind of chain as well. And often, you know, if you ask the question, who do you choose to beat? Chances are that you will not choose to beat your boss. Chances are that you will not choose to beat somebody in the streets who could respond to you. So we choose to beat people who we see as less powerful than us. Yeah? So the husband sees the wife as less powerful than him, so he'll beat the wife. And the wife will see the child as less powerful, so it's a way of taking out frustration. So violence is a way of releasing frustration on somebody who is not as powerful as you. Yeah? And that is why it's wrong, because in some ways, you know, if you beat anyone who is less powerful than you, then somebody more powerful can also beat you. Yeah? And, and, and it's not right ethically. So that there are different ways in which we should break the chain. And one of them is to recognize that all of us have rights, all of us have dignity as individuals. All of us, regardless of who we are, what we do in life, even children, yeah? that they have integrity of their body, they have dignity as persons. And it's, by the way, all of this is guaranteed in a lot of legislations that we have signed as a country, Uganda. Yes. Yeah? Starting from the Constitution to African charters to many other legislation that we have put our signature to. We are recognizing that children, adults, all of us have equal integrity as a person and that we have dignity as human beings and that nobody should have a right to violate that. So violence is wrong because in some ways it's an abuse of your power. Yes. And that is why, again, it's important to break that link and that chain of intergenerational. Well, thank you very much for that. It was very enlightening. Thank you for having me again. When you think of people on death row in Luzira, you may ask yourself, were these people born criminals? Did they always want to kill? Today, we talk to Alienio Marx, a death row prisoner in Luzira Upper Prison. We first came to know Alienio Marx when he participated in a competition organized by Raising Voices. That was 2009 to 2010. He tells us how the violence he experienced as a child has contributed to where he finds himself today. So what inspired you to write uh, the essay on corporal punishment for the competition? Uh, the first inspiration I got to write uh, an essay about corporal punishment was that I have been a victim of corporal punishment myself. Uh, I suffered corporal punishment from childhood, and what made it even worse because I was, I mean, it was the fact that I was uh, an orphan. 
and I had the siblings behind me whom I catered for. Now we were brought under the care of uh, a maid who was not related to us. But then this maid tended to be very hostile on our side, that whenever the, the, the caretaker was not around, she could end up torturing us. And that made me to try to run away from home. I was uh, just about eight years old. Yeah. And by that time I was uh, now in P1. So because of that, when I came across the advertisement in the newspaper, I had to take interest and write, I mean, to write about that. Okay. Yeah. okay. As someone who had corporal punishment as a child, do you feel it had consequences on you as an adult? Yeah, it really affected me. It affected me in the sense that I couldn't manage to continue with his studies well. Because as I joined P1, I, it happened that I got a teacher who was very hostile. Whenever I could give some questions early in the morning and you failed to answer it correctly, then the reward was corporal punishment and where I could use a metallic key to pull you from the ground when he has pushed it inside your nose as a, a way of rewarding you for the failure. So that one really affected me so much because I had to jump a year without continuing with the studies. Then after the parents realized, they shifted me to another school. Why do you think it's important for people to stop using corporal punishment to discipline children? It's really important to stop using corporal punishment because the effect is really very bad, especially on children. Because now, I myself being an I mean a victim of corporal punishment, I underwent a lot of suffering being subjected to corporal punishment. And I ended up hating myself. I felt like if I could just commit either suicide, because it made me to grow up somebody who was really timid, I, living under fear, that home became a hell to me, school was also another problem. So to me, I feel a human being cannot be brought up better. Because even animals deserve their rights to live without torture. Yeah. You're right about that. And do you think that it had consequences? Yes, you experienced it as a child, but now as an adult, do you feel you, it had consequences? Very much. First of all, it, it, it hindered my education. Because I would have not seen this kind of life I'm in mean today. I would have progressed with my education to a better level. And do you feel that the experiences you had, these bad experiences you had as a child, have contributed to you being in prison today? Yeah. As I mentioned earlier, it contributed a lot to my being here. So I believe if I was well educated, based on the experiences I've got here, most of the pe I mean, people within my surroundings here are people who have not got, I mean, attained better education. Illiteracy associated with ignorance is a contributing factor to this kind of life which we have now found ourselves in. So if I continue with my education well, without being uh, hindered by the use of or torture that I underwent, I think I would have not seen this life here. What about when it came to dealing with your own children? Did you also find, because you experienced it, you also ended up doing the same thing? Yeah, about my children, this time I don't do it to them. Because one time I only cane them. And I realized that I had already done something bad to them because they failed to work properly. And yet I did in love. I thought I was doing something to correct them from the mistakes. I realized it was a mistake, so I stopped it completely. And what advice do you have for parents and teachers who use corporal punishment all the time? I call upon everybody to be a voice against corporal punishment because it's not a wise way to take in order to discipline people or to instill discipline in a person. A person deserves to grow up in a free environment from torture because even animals deserve the rights from being tortured. So a human being really should be protected from corporal punishment. So think about it. What kind of environment is your child growing in? And what type of relationship are you creating with him or her? Join us again next week, same time, where we shall be discussing the benefits of being nonviolent. Bye bye. <laughs>